Hello, I'm Calvin Goforth, and I'm CEO of VicTech. We're a venture development firm that builds companies based on innovative medical and life science technologies sourced from top research institutions worldwide. These companies are high impact and high investor return opportunities. I'd like to share with you a few examples of some of the companies that we are building within the VicTech ecosystem. Today, we are going to focus on therapeutic and vaccine companies in the VicTech portfolio. Let's begin with Biologics MD. Biologics MD is developing biologic drugs for the treatment of hair loss and bone disorders. David Owens, CEO of Biologics MD, is joining me to give a brief overview of the company. David, thank you for joining me today. You've been successfully, you know, successful in your career. You've taken multiple therapeutics companies through to large exits. And I know that you think Biologics MD has huge potential. So why don't we start with you describing why Biologics MD is exciting to you, both in terms of impact on people's lives and in terms of the commercial opportunity for the company. Well, hi, hi, Calvin. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts on Biologics MD. Since I uh, very first got started with the company a number of years ago, what first attracted to me to the technology was the fact that um, we had uh, created a very elegant way by which we could target the biologic activities of our, our agents to specific tissues or receptors of interest. And by that, I mean, we, by the construct of the, uh, of the proteins, we have a, a very unique collagen binding domain uh, that is coupled to an agonist or to an agonist, uh, to an agonist or to an antagonist of the of uh, parathyroid hormone receptor and by putting those two things together we're able to uh, target our receptor or we target the pth receptors in those organs of interest and for us it's specifically bone and skin and by doing this uh, we're able to prevent off target effects we're able to target the receptor target the receptor put the therapeutic protein right to where we want it to be and then not have it circulating throughout the body, causing other types of effects that are not uh, un they're unwanted, uh, what we call more off-target effects. That's uh, really one of the, the goals in therapeutics is to get the right product, the right drug to the right place for the right amount of time and not have it anywhere else. So that is uh, one of the unique things about the technology that first attracted me to it. And the um, other part of it is that the commercial opportunity for targeting of uh, the parathyroid hormone receptor in both the skin and in, in the hair, I, I'm sorry, in the skin and in the bone, allows us to uh, stimulate both hair growth. So all different types of hair growth disorders can be stimulated to go back into a state of hair growth, which is something that's a really big unmet medical need. And then also for bone, uh, we can restore bone, whether it's osteoporotic bone uh, bone fractures or possibly even bone fusion to cause growth of bone without having any untoward effects. So it's a very elegant technology that I think has a lot of com very much big commercial appeal. And um, I'm very excited about it. Th thanks, David. I know that the company, you know, the technology has, you know, several important applications, which you, you've alluded to, and each of those really is a large market opportunity. Maybe you could tell us why did you choose alopecia uh, areata as the company's lead indication? Well, we looked at the, when I got involved with the company, I brought in a couple of pharmaceutical experts, and, uh, our heads of R&D at some of the larger companies that I had connections with. And we reviewed the data on um, all the preclinical data on all the applications that we had. And the company first started in osteoporosis, which is an attractive market. Um, there has been a number of new innovations that have happened for a long, uh, over the last several years, but it's a market that takes a lot of effort, time, and money to develop new agents for. When they got a look at the data that we had in for hair loss, whether it was chemotherapy-induced hair, uh, hair loss or, or alopecia or, al or the alopecia area model model, they were intrigued by the fact that we were seeing such a profound effect and because that area hasn't had much innovation, there hasn't been a lot of new agents or anything that, that have really brought much of a benefit to patients in that space. They thought it was something that we ought to take a careful look at because it could probably be done much quicker um, for possibly less expense 
and have a much bigger impact uh, because there's no there's very few products in the market. So that was one of the reasons why we 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 pivoted, if you would, from more of the bone uh, disorders into the alopecia market. And the one of the other um, interesting things about it is that the regulatory pathway is pretty well uh, described. Uh, there haven't, uh, like I said, been a lot of new agents in that space. There just recently was a product approved for alopecia areata by Eli Lilly. And the pathway uh, through the clinical development and also through uh, the FDA is pretty clear. Uh, so it didn't really, it reduces a lot of risk that we may not have to uh, take up with other type of uh, indications we're looking for. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, what do you see as the exit timeline and exit potential for investors in, in the company? I know you've seen some big dollar exits in your career. How does how does the Biologics MD opportunity compare? Well, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I've had a couple of really interesting one, good ones. As you know, I get involved at very early stages. I get involved when the tech, you know, usually in the seed level and um, and then bring in uh, venture money, institutional money. And then I've, I've stayed with companies or I've departed from companies after that's happened. I've had two very interesting exits. Um, one exit was for a company that we sold in phase 1B, proof of concept. Uh, we When I first got involved with the company, we had raised 300,000. Um, I got involved, we raised another 25 million. And my investors and myself put money into the company and an institutional raise, and we ended up selling it for 600 million. I mean, so we have a total raise of 38, about $38 million with a return of 600 million. Another company I got involved with, uh, a little smaller, um, and we just sold it this last year. Uh, we only raised $4 million in, in uh, seed money, and we never even got institutional money. We were able to sell that for 200 million. I think Biologics MD is bigger than both of those, no question. Um, because the the markets are so big and the novelty of the agent and the mechanism by which we work is so unique and I think so commercially appealing and scientifically appealing that if we're able to raise the institutional capital to get us into human proof of concept studies for alopecia, alopecia areata, I see this being well north of $600 million, uh, maybe hopefully as close as a billion dollars. And the timing for that would be we're right now raising our, our first institutional round. All the money so far has been primarily from economic development groups, from uh, non-dilutive sources, such as the Department of Defense and also from early stage investors. But we, we're looking to try and raise $20 million in the next uh, six to 12 months. And when after we get, have that raise in, in, we think that the timing to, con, to can do all the clinical development that we need to for first human proof of concept studies is about a three-year time window. So having a uh, an institutional raise when that's completed, we're looking at about a three to four-year time frame in which we think we could have an exit. And we've already had discussions with some of the potential acquirers. So we they know about what we're doing and they have point blank told us that if you can prove this in humans, we'll be very interested. So that's where our mission is. That's where we're hopeful. And uh, with all good luck and success, I think we can achieve it. Thanks, David. The, the company's really got a fantastic intellectual property foundation. You've put together an incredible team and I really look forward to big things from Biologics MD. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Calvin. Pleasure. Okay, next up is Knob Hill Therapeutics. Knob Hill is creating more effective inhalation therapies to address lower respiratory tract infections and diseases. The company has a novel dry powder nebulizer technology that ensures reproducible drug delivery into the deep lung, no matter the lung function of the patient. Paul Atkins is the executive chairman of Knob Hill, and he's going to tell us more. Hi, Paul. Thank you for joining me today. You're a veteran in the inhaled therapeutic space. What, what attracted you to join Knob Hill as its ex executive chairman? Yeah, good morning, uh, Calvin, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about Knob Hill. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity uh, that Nopil brings because it really, I think the technology allows uh, us to think about changing the paradigm of how we get drugs to the lung. Um, I was totally unaware of the company just over a year ago. Um, I was uh, excited when I heard that somebody who I'd known for many years, Dr. Hugh Smythe, a professor at the University of Texas previously at the University of Mexico was involved, 
Um, and so, yeah, when I uh, found out that he was involved, uh, Hugh and I worked together many years ago. Um, and so basically, uh, I think the technology is fundamentally sound. And we're in a position where we can uh, basically think about giving much better or much higher doses of drug to the lung in a very efficient manner. Um, not only, as you know, not only am I chairman, but I'm also an investor in the company. So that's uh, that's my level of excitement about uh, taking this technology forward. Yes, uh, and that's always a great indication of the management team's uh, level of uh, engagement. So uh, tell us about the business strategy for the company. Yeah, so basically the technology, um, there's sort of two foci, if you will, uh, the first is that the technology we believe could be a platform. So what do I mean by that? Basically, it's a platform that could deliver many drugs uh, to the lung um, in different diseases. Um, and so we have really, um, um, without marketing the company, we've been approached by now uh, I keep saying I'll have said a handful, but actually it's more than a handful now. It's almost up to, uh, you know, I think two handful. Um, so we're up to, we're talking to eight, nine companies about the opportunity to deliver their drugs. Um, so that's sort of the platform technology piece of it. And then the second piece is that we also um, we recently received in, in the summer this year, um, uh, a grant from the uh, NIH, uh, SBIR uh, funding mechanism to look at the delivery of a specific therapeutic, and that is uh, uh, an antifungal uh, agent uh, for the treatment of pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, and the interesting thing about that, and and, and sometimes uh, 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 you know things things go in your favor. Uh, just recently, uh, the World Health Organization identified a number. I think it was the top ten. Um, uh, fungal diseases, um, and it turns out that aspergillosis, invasive, invasive aspergillosis, is actually number four. So there's a lot of interest in looking at some of these diseases, which heretofore have not really had much attention. We can bring um, the opportunity to treat those diseases by using the dry nerve in conjunction with a, a therapeutic uh, that we've identified uh, called antiterrasin B. So we're very, very well positioned, not only to develop the platform, but also to develop the, uh, the if you like, the combination product of the platform plus an inhaled anti, uh, antifungal. Very good. How, how, how big of an opportunity do you think that Knob Hill has, both in terms of human impact and in terms of the market opportunity? I think to quantify that, it, it really depends a little bit on, on how you slice the onion. I mean, the inhaled market today uh, is 18 billion, 17, 18 billion dollars. Now, you know, we won't play in that full market. We'll play in a subsection of that market for um, diseases where the doses are going to be in the order of milligrams. But having said that, um, you know, you can think about not just inhaled antifungals, but you can think about inhaled anti-cancer, you can think about inhaled antivirals. Um, uh, and one of the things that I think is, is really differentiates this and has the opportunity to change the paradigm is that we can deliver drugs using this technology in a relatively short period of time. So not only is it gonna allow drugs to be delivered to the lung efficiently, but it's also going to improve the lives of patients, not just because we're treating their disease, but because they can actually take these drugs in a, you know, a few minutes, as opposed to more conventional liquid nebulizers, which may, you know, in some cases require 15, 20 minutes, two or three times a day. So I think the benefit is there in terms of, of providing a, a, an armamentarian of drugs um, and then uh, to treat lung diseases, and then also for the patients, it's going to be much, much better for the patients to use a, a device, the dry neb, um, than, than a conventional nebulizer. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we don't really have time to describe the team, but you've really assembled a world-class group, and I'm confident that the company is going to have a major impact on the treatment of a variety of lung conditions. I do appreciate you joining me today. 
Thank you. And uh, we'll uh, speak again soon, Calvin. Thank you. Hi, Michael. You're a life science industry veteran with multiple exits under your belt. Tell us about Solaris Vaccines. This is one of Vic's newest companies, but also one of the most exciting. Tell us what Solaris does and why it could have such a huge impact. Yeah, thank you, Calvin. Happy to give an overview of, of Solaris and what we're working on. So Solaris is developing a new approach to creating vaccines, uh, which we believe will be faster and more effective. It avoids some of the challenges, some of the problems or limitations of current vaccine manufacturing approaches. Uh, the technology was licensed from Colorado State University. Um, it has benefited from over $20 million in grant and contract funding to the inventor's lab. Um, 18 million of that is a contract from NIAID, uh, which is focusing on validating a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine using this approach. Uh, and that 18 million will get it ultimately through phase one uh, testing in, in humans. But let me back up for a second. So what are the unmet needs in the vaccine space? So there are many different pathogens. And when I say pathogens, I mean viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungal infections that either do not have any vaccine available. And some notable examples of that are HIV and Zika, um, malaria, leishmania. But there's also a whole list of uh, infectious diseases which have vaccines that are suboptimal. I mean, let's talk about the flu vaccine, 40 to 60% effectiveness uh, for any given season. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, you know, the Ebola vaccine uh, requires storage at minus 80 degrees centigrade. So they're not very um, usable. They're not very amenable to developing world um, applications. And then there are the diseases that we don't even know about or don't yet exist. SARS-3, MERS-2, new influ influenza strains that are uh, potentially pandemic that we want to be prepared for and have a solution before they occur, not months or years afterwards. So the premise or the approach to um, the Solavax technology, and that's the name of the technology, is that we use a combination of a photosensitizer, which in this case is vitamin B2, um, so non-toxic, and exposure to UV light, and the combination of those two disrupt the genetic material of the infectious disease. But it maintains the external component of that pathogen. These are the antigens that elicit the immune response when they're injected into, into the human patients. Um, and we believe that the advantages of this technology are that um, it is one, very fast, right? We can take an identified strain of a pathogen, grow it in a bioreactor, inactivate it, purify it, and then it's ready to be distributed. It doesn't use any toxic chemicals for the purification process is much faster and safer for the workers. And the, the ultimate product can be stored at, at lowest four degrees. So that's a refrigerator but we're also exploring um, lyophilized uh, products or uh, preparations which can be stored at room temperature. So it really extends the utility, the extensibility of the technology to both developed and developing world opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Michael, that's, that's exciting. Um, let me ask you a follow-up question. The, the COVID mRNA vaccines that everyone knows about, you know, they were brought forward in record time you know, after the onset of the pandemic, and they've saved a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have no doubt there will be more mRNA-based vaccines in the future. But I also know they're not a panacea. Well, can you tell us a little bit about some of the limitations of mRNA vaccines that are perhaps not a limitation for the Solaris Solovax technology? Absolutely. And let me first uh, share my enthusiasm for mRNA vaccines. I mean, they They've been in the works for years, if not decades, and it took the, the COVID-19 pandemic to give them their opportunity to prove, prove themselves. So there's huge opportunity there, and there are specific diseases where mRNA vaccines do make sense. The, the limitations of, of this approach is, one, it only um, has one antigen in the mRNA, so the spike protein. SARS-CoV-2 has many other potential antigens. Um, and you have to change that sequence with every new emerging variation of the virus. The other thing too, is it's only presenting that antigen in one antigen and not in the context of how it would be presented in the intact viral particle. Other uh, shortcomings are 
yes, they do provide some immunity, but it's not always fully protected. People still get sick, although not as um, not as severely ill, and they don't have to go to the hospital and be you know uh, intubated and put on a ventilator. And the the durability of the protection is also limited. So you know most of us are on our fourth or fifth dose uh, or injection of the the vaccine, um, and we don't know what the long-term health implications will be for, for getting multiple um, doses of these mRNA vaccines. They, they contain some chemicals, which we don't have a lot of experience with in humans. So that remains to be seen. So our approach, some of the advantages of the Solovax uh, approach are that we're presenting all the antigens on that infectious um, particle or that pathogen, excuse me. Um, however, it's been inactivated, so it won't cause disease. And they're, they're in the um, environment, the confirmation, the context as the, the normal wild type uh, pathogen would be. So the immune response to that is much more authentic, we believe much more durable and um, enhanced because of that compared to not only mRNA vaccines, but other approaches to vaccine manufacturing, such as uh, disrupted, uh, inactivated vaccines, attenuated vaccines, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's that's a, a great description. Last question: How do you foresee the uh, Solaris company growth path and timeline? Yeah, absolutely. So, as I mentioned earlier, we are very fortunate that there's been significant, um, you know, commitments by the federal government, specifically NIH, NIAID to uh, further uh, validate this technology for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the company, that funding is going to CSU, the company is pursuing funding for other, other applications. And we, what we want to do is really demonstrate that this is a true vaccine manufacturing platform. So proof of concept data for one or two viruses, proof of concept data for one or two bacteria, a parasite, maybe even a fungal pathogen. Um, so we are in the process of securing funding from uh, non-dilutive sources such as NIH and uh, DOD-related opportunities. Obviously, you know that there's a um, huge commitment to find faster, better vaccine manufacturing approaches, and this definitely falls within that category. Um, as an investment opportunity, what I want to highlight here is that there is already a lot of data in place. And a lot of unmet need. And so with some modest uh, investments, we can really move this closer toward an exit opportunity, which would most likely be acquisition by a large vaccine company um, that is looking for novel, improved approaches to, to vaccine development. Very good. Thank you, Michael. I, I personally think Solaris has a big future ahead of it, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. Agreed. Thank you for the opportunity to share the story. Those are examples of the sort of high impact companies being built by VicTech. Part two of this video series will look at some of our breakthrough medical device companies. I think you'll find them very interesting. Thank you for watching.